If you want to open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and uh, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to kind of lay a foundation. We're going to look at four biblical premises, and that's going to sort of build us a foundation. And then once that foundation is built, we're going to look at part of one verse here. It's an exhortation given in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So I think in order for us to really fully grasp the exhortation, I think it's a good idea for us to have some foundation first. So if we get through and it's like, we've been 15 minutes and he hasn't even mentioned the verse yet, we're never going to get out of here. Understand that the premise is part of it, okay? So let's pray and then we'll, we'll dive in. Father, thank you for each person that is in this room, each person that's listening online. Thank you, Lord, that you love them. Thank you, Lord, that you have a purpose and a plan for them. And thank you, Lord, that you want to speak to them today from your word. And we pray that you would. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, here's our first premise. Okay? Our first premise is that Jesus is a king. Okay? Jesus is a king. When we're first introduced to Jesus, when the first of the gospel narratives open, um, it opens with Jesus coming from the genealogy of David. He's a king. When the wise men follow the star and they arrive there in the city, they ask to see the king. In fact, the drama that's developed as the book of Matthew opens is a drama because an earthly king named Herod is threatened by the birth of this new king named Jesus, right? So Jesus is a king. And this idea of him being king is developed as he continues his earthly ministry. In fact, there's even a scene in John chapter 6, it's kind of the height of his popularity where they attempt to take him by force and make him a king. Later, we just celebrated, um, uh, you know, two Sundays ago, we celebrated an event we call Palm Sunday. What's Palm Sunday? Jesus declaring himself as the Messiah King that the prophets had been speaking about. And the, the fact that Jesus is a king, some of his kingly reign was already manifested when he was doing his ministry on earth. We see that there are many things that subjected themselves to King Jesus while he was on earth, things that no other king have ever seen bow to them. For instance, nature. Does nature bow to earthly kings? Can an earthly king make a decree that affects nature? No. Does does nature bow to King Jesus? Jesus looks at the wind and the waves and he tells them to be quiet. And what happens? It goes calm. How about sickness? Does does sickness bow to earthly kings? Of course not. But did sickness bow to King Jesus? Jesus Jesus had behind him, Jesus left, you might say, in his wake, he had people that were blind that saw, deaf that heard, people that were lame that walked, people that were lepers that were cured. I mean, Sickness bows to King Jesus. How about, how about um, uh, the spiritual realm? Does the spiritual realm bow to natural kings? Is that what happens? You know the story of Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible? He's the most powerful man, the most prominent man in the entire world. He's the wealthiest man in the world. And with just a touch, he lost his mind. He went completely insane. He lived, he lived no longer in the palace. He lived in the garden. He thought that he was an animal. He grew his, ha- his nails long like claws, his, his hair long like fur. He'd completely lost his mind. And then he, another touch from heaven, and he was cured. <laughs> the, sp- the spirit realm is not under the authority of earthly kings. But does the spirit realm bow to King Jesus? <laughs> it does. Jesus just speaks, and the demons flee. How about death? Does, does death bow to earthly kings? The most powerful men that have ever lived bow to death. But does death bow to King Jesus? We celebrated last Sunday, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus, right? But do you know that every time when, when you're in need and every time you proverbially bow your knee and you look to heaven and you say, God, I need you, do you know you're celebrating the resurrected Jesus? Do you know you're accessing a place the Bible calls the throne of grace, a place where mercy can be found and grace can be given, 
We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Every time that, that a loved one passes, we're celebrating a resurrected Jesus. Anytime you're facing a threat, a fear of death, you're celebrating the resurrection. Jesus conquers death. He's a king like no other king, right? So here's our first premise. Jesus is a king. Here's our second premise. Jesus came to bring a kingdom. Jesus came to bring a kingdom. The the primary pre-cross ministry of Jesus, meaning what Jesus spent most of his time doing in his three and a half years of ministry, was teaching. Well over a hundred times, Jesus is referred to as a teacher, or the verb teaching is used to describe what Jesus is doing. He's a teacher. And the primary subject of his teaching was something he called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. That's what he talked about. He came to bring a kingdom. When he was talking to people who were not yet part of that kingdom, he talked about entry into the kingdom. He talked about how you could become a citizen of that kingdom. Most famously, he was with a man by the name of Nicodemus. And he says to Nicodemus, he says, Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. He's saying there's an entryway into the kingdom of God, and this entryway Jesus called being born again. If you want to be a citizen of God's kingdom, you want to have all of the benefits that come with being part of that kingdom, he says the entryway is born again. And born again, simply put, is putting faith in Christ. It it looks like this. If, If you've yet to do that, it looks like this. You look at the cross and you say, I recognize Jesus is the Savior. I'm a sinner. I want Jesus to be my Savior. Just believe in Jesus. Say, Jesus, I believe that that you've come to forgive my sin. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have entryway into his kingdom. You become a citizen of his kingdom. And, and, uh, you know, you can do that right this moment. Sitting in your living room, if you're watching online, or if you're sitting there, you don't have to wait till the end of the service. You can come pray with somebody, but right where you're seated, you can say, Jesus, I believe that. I want that. I want to be a citizen of that kingdom. So Jesus came to bring a kingdom his, his conversation when he was talking to people who were not yet part of that kingdom was an invitation in. The, the, Paul put it like this. Paul said, God desires all men everywhere to be saved, to enter into that kingdom. Now, when Jesus was talking to people who had made profession of faith, they'd, they'd believed in him or they'd made profession of believing in him, then he communicated to them about how to behave as citizens of that kingdom. That you're, you're part of a different kingdom now. So you have, a, you have a different lifestyle. The most comprehensive portion of Scripture on that subject is what's called the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, where Jesus gathers his followers together and he says, okay, look, we're having a conference, we're having a retreat, and we're going to talk about how to be citizens of my kingdom, how to live differently now that you're a follower of Jesus. But he had a kingdom. So our, our first premise is Jesus is a king. Our second premise is that Jesus has a kingdom. Our third premise is this. Jesus anticipated or expected that his kingdom would spread. He expected that it would grow. Um, The the kingdom of God will ultimately find its fulfillment when Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom. And the Bible tells us that at, at that point, righteousness will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. Now, righteousness is a word that means, in in that case, it would be a word that would mean to put things right. In other words, when Jesus comes, everything will be put back into its right order. People will have a right view of God. People will have a right view of themselves. People will have a right view of marriage and of family and of community. They'll have a right value system. They'll have a, 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 a correct understanding of right and wrong. Like everything will be put back into the, into the way in which God intended it. And the prophets spoke about the time when Jesus sets up his kingdom, that this righteousness is going to cover the whole earth. Okay? But what, what Jesus is saying is he's saying, I, I have an expectation that although that's the final fulfillment, Jesus had an expectation that his kingdom would spread. He told a couple of really interesting parables. They they have the same meaning. Um, One parable, he said that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that you plant into the ground, 
and it grows to become an enormous tree. Now, I'm not a botanist. Botanists are, are the plant guys, right? Okay, I'm not that guy, okay? I'm not a botanist. Um, I, can, I can wither plastic plants. But, uh, but I, I, I think I know that mustard seeds don't grow into no, to big trees. That's not what they become. They don't become enormous trees that, that birds from all over come and, and flock in and people come and find rest in. So what Jesus was talking about is he's talking about, he says, the kingdom of God is like this mustard seed that grows into this massive tree. He's talking about an unnatural growth. Another word for unnatural could be supernatural. There's something, there's something unnatural about this. It's going to grow and it's going to spread all over the place. It's going to have some problems. There's going to be some birds in it. He said a second parable. He said the kingdom of God is like leaven. And you put it into the dough and it affects the whole dough and the whole, thing, the whole thing is impacted by it. He's talking about this incredible influence that his kingdom is going to have in the world. In fact, there's a passage in Matthew 24 as Jesus is kind of talking about what the world will be looking like as we're moving towards the time of his return. And he said, this, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in the whole world as a testimony to them. Then the end will come. Jesus is anticipating that the gospel will go from this tiny little fishing village with a handful of followers that it will, infect, it will infect the entire world. That's his anticipation. Was he right? That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? It's pretty remarkable to get together with 12 uneducated guys and say, yeah, this is going to influence the entirety of the world. There's an expectation that his kingdom would grow. Our fourth premise is this, is that not only Jesus a king who has a kingdom and anticipates this kingdom developing or growing or spreading, but our fourth premise is that this kingdom will face opposition. The way in which Jesus um, designed his kingdom to grow he's, is he, he chose a handful of men and women, and told them that they were to wait to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they were to go out into the world, correct? Pretty simple um, procedure that he put in place. Be filled with the Spirit, go into the world. And, uh, but he told them that they would be expecting opposition or difficulty. He said things like, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. <laughs> that's like a super bad idea. <laughs> it's like there's no part of that that's a good idea. Okay? I'm, I'm saying, he, said, he said, you know, blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake. He said, blessed are you when men revile you and, and, and speak evil of you falsely for my name's sake. He, he said that, that um, oh, my, my brain just went blank, but he said some other stuff. So the, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of cool stuff, man. So... But the, you get the idea, like Jesus is saying, there's going to be this opposition. In the world, you're going to face tribulation. And then if, if the, the book of Acts serves as a model for us of what we should expect today, then we should expect that there's going to be opposition to any attempt that we would be involved in, in furthering this, the kingdom that Jesus wants to further. Right? These guys, they had false accusations brought against them. There were people of influence that were using their influence to speak falsely and negatively about the, the, this Christian message, this Christian movement. That's happening in the, books of, in the book of Acts. There was threat. There was, there was physical opposition. There was even the threat of and ultimately incarceration that came. There was persecution. There was opposition along the way. So... Here's our premises before we look at our text. Jesus is a king like no other king. He has a kingdom like no other kingdom. He anticipates or expects this kingdom to, to grow, to spread, to expand, but he also realizes that it will face opposition in its attempt to do so. So with that said, let's look at our text. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. If you didn't get there quick enough, that's as much as we're going to read, but I'll read it again so you can follow along. Fight the good fight of faith. So what's happening is, is Timothy is receiving several exhortations 
from Paul as it relates to ministering to the body, caring for the church there in Ephesus. And then he receives a series of exhortations that are directed specifically at him. And this is one of them. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Let's make a couple observations. Observation number one, did you notice that there's a repeated word in that statement? What's the repeated word? Fight, okay? And it's used two different ways in the sentence. It, first, it's used as a verb, okay? It's an imperative verb, which means that we're told to do something. And the second time it's used, it's used as a noun. It has the, um, the definite article in front of it. Fight the good fight, right? So there is a, 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 the, a verb is the action, and a fight is sort of the, the scene in which we're to do it. Fight the good fight of faith. I want you to notice something else. I want you to notice that uh, maybe three things about this. Number one is that there is a call here. Well, let me rephrase it. Number one is that there is something called a fight. Okay? There is a fight. Now, this is an, an, an unfortunate but also a very common metaphor in the New Testament to describe the Christian experience. By unfortunate, I mean it would be much better if the Christian experience could be illustrated by things like rest in the good hammock of faith or vacation in the gulf breeze of faith, right? Or, you know, or, you know whatever, whatever fun experience that you want to think of, you could, you could put in there. But that doesn't properly represent the real Christian experience. So it's unfortunate, but it's also very common. That we're we're uh, earlier in 1 Timothy, Timothy is told to wage the good warfare. In 2 Timothy, he's, he's, the Christian experience is, is compared to a soldier who's in battle and can't get entangled with the things of the world. Paul used the metaphor of wrestling, right, a wrestling match against a host of spiritual forces. We read about things in the Bible like like helmets and shields and swords and spears and, you know, breastplates or whatever, like all this, this battle metaphor. Those are, in my mind, super unfortunate illustrations because they illustrate something that I don't want to be a part of, right? I mean, I, I try to avoid a fight. I don't, I'm not looking for it. I'm not trying to start a fight. I'm trying to avoid a fight. Like, we have... We have adrenaline that races through our body when we get into sort of precarious circumstances. And you remember back from seventh grade biology, and, and you learned when that adrenaline races through your body, it causes one of two reactions. What are the two reactions? Fight or what? Flight. How many flighters? <laughs> I was like, I don't want to fight you. <laughs> I was at this, this camping trip, this men's camping trip a couple of weeks ago, and there's this sign, like, right where we have all the tents and stuff set up. And it's a sign, and it's, it's giving you instruction on what to do if you come in contact with a black bear. Okay, this is what it says. If you see a black bear, move slowly, speak calmly, back away slowly. So I'm just like kind of picturing it. So here I come, I see the black, come around the corner, I see the black bear, it's like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt your day. Um, clearly we're at an impasse. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the bigger man, and I'm just going to walk away slowly. <laughs> Seriously, that's what I'm going to do? <laughs> no. <laughs> right? I mean, we don't, we don't want that. But, but here's the reality. Paul's saying there's a fight. There is a fight. And the, the, so the noun, there is a fight, but there's also a verb, right? The verb is to fight. Look at it again. I, I'm sorry if this is... Seventh grade English for you, but um, take a look, verse 12 again. Fight the good fight of faith. Who's the subject? Who's the subject? We are, the reader, right? In, in the, initially, it was Timothy, but this is designed. This is God's word designed for God's people. So the subject is me. Like, I have a responsibility here. There's this thing called a fight it's, it's, it's out there, it, it, it describes the Christian experience, and I'm a follower of Jesus, and I'm told that I am, I'm enlisted into this. I am called into this fight. 
So there is a fight. I'm called to this fight, but I want you to notice a third thing, that this fight is different. What does he, what, he, he modifies it. He says, fight the good fight of what? Faith. It's a fight of what? It's a fight of faith. It's a different fight. Um, on the night, well, on the day that Jesus was crucified, you remember he was standing before Pilate, and Pilate asked him the question. He says, are you a king? And I love Jesus' response. He says, are you asking for yourself or are you asking for someone else? In other words, are you interested in, in, are you interested in becoming a citizen of this kingdom? And Pilate, you know, is a little bit combative with him and basically asks him again. And Jesus says, I am a king and it's for this reason that I've come into the world. But he says, my kingdom is not of this world because if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting right now. One of those servants has a vivid illustration of the fact that the fight that we're in is a different kind of fight. Remember when they were in the garden and the, the mob comes with swords and with torches and clubs and they come onto the scene and they, they accost Jesus and what does Peter do? Peter exercises his right to bear arms and he takes a shot at uh, the, one of the servants of the high priest and what happens? Cuts his ear off and then Jesus tells him to put it away. Saying, that's not our fight. This kingdom, I'm a king. I have a kingdom. I have an anticipation that this kingdom spreads. There's going to be opposition. You're experiencing it right now in the garden. But that's not the way we fight. As citizens of this kingdom, we fight differently. So here's what I want to do in the, in the remainder of our time. I want to talk about three things that this fight is. Okay, we might say three ways that we fight or, or three aspects of this fight that we're involved in. Number one, what is our fight? Our fight is a rescue mission. I'm going to illustrate it, then I'm going to explain it. Our fight is a rescue mission. In the book of Genesis, there's a really interesting uh, scenario that develops. You remember the scene where Abraham and Lot, they've been in business together. They've been tremendously successful, so successful that that the land cannot support all of the the herds and flocks that they have, so they're going to have to divide their business. So they go up on a hill. Abraham says, look out at the lands. Whichever direction you want to go, I'll go the opposite direction. Lot chooses to go towards the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. That changes the storyline. We then follow Lot as he abandons the family business and moves into the city of Sodom. Another storyline develops. The king of Sodom, along with four other kings, um, had been paying tribute to a king from Syria, Uh, named Chedalomar, and uh, they decided that they were tired of paying tribute, so they stopped. So Chedalomar gathers his forces, three other kings, and they march down, and in the plains in that area, a battle ensues. And the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and these three other city-states, their armies are defeated, the cities are plundered, the loot and the people are taken, and uh, the Chedalomar and his forces begin to make their way back north up into Syria. Word comes to Abraham. Abraham hears that his loved one, Lot, has been taken captive by Chedalomar. And so Abraham gathers his 318 trained servants, and they go out in pursuit of Chedalomar's forces in order to rescue Lot. Quick pause. What was Abraham's profession? He's a shepherd. So his trained servants were trained to do what? Shepherd, okay? These are not military men. Abraham did not have a paramilitary camp, you know, where they woke up every morning and ran through tires and crawled underneath barbed wire and practiced shooting. These guys were not trained as soldiers. They were trained as shepherds, and yet there was a rescue mission And they trusted that God would be involved, and they went in pursuit. And they traveled all the way north of Damascus, and they took, I'm sorry, north of Dan, and then then followed all the way up in to north of Damascus. And they took Chedalomar's uh, forces by surprise, and they were able to rescue Lot and the other inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah and bring them home. It was a rescue mission. Somebody was held captive. That illustrates the fight that we're involved in. Jesus was in a conversation with Peter, 
And, and he, it's that famous conversation where he says, who do men say that I am? And then he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the son of God and the savior of the world, the Christ and the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, because flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And then he says this, and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against the church. Remember that statement? The gates of hell. Now, the gate can refer to two things. Number one, it can refer to a, a place where, where sort of counsel and strategy is worked out, but it can also refer to simply something that encloses people in. Jesus is alluding to the fact that be, until a person comes in to, to, to put faith in Jesus Christ and become a citizen of his kingdom, that person is held captive in their sin. Paul wrote to the, to the Corinthians, and he said that if, if the gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose, whose eyes the God of this age has blinded, lest the gospel should come in. And so people are held captive in their sin. The, our fight is a rescue mission to see the people that we love come out from the bondage that they're held into and into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's our mission. That's what we've been called to. Now, Jesus equips us for that mission. You go, listen, I'm not a trained, you know, rescue ranger. That's not, my kids have those toys. So that, I'm not trained in that. Like I'm a, I, you know, I'm a mechanic. It's like, okay, Abraham's 318 trained servants believe that God could equip them to, to rescue Lot as well. God equips us. And the primary way he equips us is giving us the tools necessary to release somebody from captivity. If you, know, if you think about different tools or different weapons that would be necessary in, in different engagements, if somebody's enclosed behind something, what would be the most important weapon? I think maybe a key. Some of you guys were thinking bombs. <laughs> I mean, you guys like every the answer to every question is a bomb. Let's blow it up, okay? But no, I'm thinking maybe there's a better one. How about just the key, right? <laughs> just let's try this, and uh, and that key that will open the door. Um, this is a true story. I don't know if it really illustrates it, but it, but um, I was I uh, grew up in Southern California. I got saved at Calvary Costa Mesa. Um, and I got involved there in the youth ministry when I was 20 years old. I started helping out in youth ministry. And the pastor invited a group of us to come early on Wednesday mornings to his office before work started, and we would, that's where he kind of discipled us. We learned how to read and study the Bible, and so there were a handful of 10 or 12 of us that would meet with him. And one morning, my friend Frank and I, we showed up there early, and, uh, and we're waiting. No one's there yet. And it's kind of a drizzly, cold morning. And just, just being silly, Frank took his house key and he put it into the key slot of the, the building that was going to be this, it was the um, pastor's offices. And he put it in, he turned it, and it unlocked the door. And we went in and we checked another door. And it turns out that just randomly, his house key was the grand master for Calvary Costa Mesa. He could get into, it was like he and Chuck had that key. And we could get into any door, didn't matter what door it was. Calvary had to re-key the entire facility because of this random key. But we're like checking all the doors. It was one key could open any door. Listen, Jesus has given us a key that can unlock any door that someone is held captive to. It's called the gospel, the gospel message. That's what we're to proclaim. Um, in a room this size, We've got people who have been set free, when you came to faith in Christ, set free from all kinds of different bondages that you were held in. For me, I, would, I think I was held in the bondage of indifference. I, just didn't, I didn't think about it. I didn't care about the gospel. I drove every day of my life. I, I, I lived and went to school on the same road. Like my elementary school, my middle school, my high school, and the college that I went to were all on the same road in Huntington Beach. The farther west I went on this road, the smarter I got. And as I drove down this road, I passed many churches, and there wasn't a single day where I went in, knocked on the door, and went, is there a God? Like, it, 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 is eternity something I should be concerned about? Should I, should I think about 
how God views the way that I live or can I just keep living however I want? Never once did I have that conversation. I was indifferent. Then I heard the gospel and the gospel awakened me. Your backstory is different. You, the, the, the thing that held you captive is different, but you know what? It was the same key that unlocked that door. That's why it's so important, especially in, in the culture that we're currently in. It is so important that we don't get caught up in, in behavior modification. We get caught up in proclaiming the gospel message. Behavior modification happens after you get saved. Jesus will change your behavior, right? He will convict you. He will transform you. But, in, but be, prior to that, it's the key, the gospel message. That's what we're sent to share. Number two, so the first fight that we're involved in is a rescue mission. The second fight that we're involved in is, is taking more ground, taking more ground. Let me illustrate it, then I'll explain it. The children of Israel, when they um, entered into the promised land, they were, they were led by Joshua. And, and the strategy is brilliant. They, they enter in, they cross the Jordan, they enter in, they camp at a place called Gilgal, uh, they take Jericho. And what they did by taking Jericho and Ai is they drew basically a dividing line in the nation. They separated the south from the north. They eliminated the ability of the Canaanites to gather all of their troops together and come at once against Israel by drawing this dividing line. Then they turned their forces and they took the south. Then they turned their forces and they took the north. Now, when that was done, God spoke to Joshua. He was super kind. He said, Joshua... You are old and well advanced in years, and there's a lot of land that has not yet been taken. So here's what you need to do. You need to divide the land up among the tribes. So they took the land and they divided it up into 12 allotments, and each tribe was given an allotment, and then each tribe was commissioned to now personally take the land that they were given. So the the entirety of the nation was taken by them corporately, But then individually as tribes, they would need to drive out the remaining inhabitants of each section of the land. Now, that is an illustration of the same thing that's true for you and I. When I say that we we further the kingdom by taking more land, maybe a better way to say it is we further the kingdom by giving up more land. We further the kingdom by allowing Jesus to take more of us. When, When you got saved... There were certain things that were were taken for you. There were certain victories that were already given for you. You you came forward and you were filled with with the Spirit of God. You were filled with love. You were filled with peace. You were filled with joy. You were filled with purpose. And in some some areas of your life, you had immediate victory. Like there were things that that you were caught up in before you came to Christ. And as a follower of Jesus, since the day you met Jesus, you've never struggled with those things again. You had victory over them but not everything, right? There's stuff you wrestle with every single day. There's stuff that have been reoccurring struggles for you. And if you don't don't stay focused in your your relationship with the Lord, you stumble back into those things. That's the land that we need to take. And so the idea behind furthering the kingdom, we further the kingdom when we'll let Jesus take more of us. When we'll say, I'm not satisfied with just what was taken for me when I put my faith in Jesus, or I'm not satisfied with just the the, the amount of growth I've had up to this point, but Jesus, I want to let you have more of me. I want to say, you know, one of the things that happens to us is we sort of settle into this is who we are. You might say, "I'm, I'm a really shy person. I could never share the gospel with anybody. And I would say, why? Can't God take that land? Can't God give you victory in that area of your life? I'm just an irritable person. I just get angry so quickly. Why? Can't God give you victory over that? Does your family really have to endure one more day of that? Couldn't couldn't you give that to God? Couldn't couldn't God give you victory over that in your life? Couldn't you surrender that at his feet? Couldn't couldn't you see a flag put in that part of the ground? Couldn't you have victory over it? Like, we can see the kingdom furthered when we'll let God take more of our land. Last thing... The the third way that we fight is we fight by taking the kingdom with us everywhere we go. Taking the kingdom with us everywhere we go. I love the sort of the mission vision of of Coastline, you know, where it's like we live on mission. We take the kingdom with us wherever we go. Let me again illustrate and then I'll explain. 
Children of Israel spent, when they, they came out of Egypt, they came to Mount Sinai, and they camped there for a year. And at Mount Sinai, they were given the law. Now, that is helpful and also maybe unfortunate that we call it the law. And, and it's unfortunate because when we think of law, we think of a set of rules telling us what we are not allowed to do, right? So we're driving and we're looking for the speed limit sign so we can know how much above it we can go without getting in trouble for it, right? And then we're also super happy when that guy goes blowing by us, right? <laughs> he goes by, he's like, thank you, because if someone's going to get a ticket, it's you, right? But, uh, but like we think of loss as uh, very um, limited as simply the things that we're told not to do and the penalties that are associated with doing them. But the word Torah, the Hebrew word for law, is, is a word that is much broader than that. It really means instruction. So, so when they sat there for a year at Mount Sinai, they were receiving instruction from God. God was speaking into the lives of the people, and he was going to instruct them about who he is. He was going to instruct them about how their lives were to be lived. He, was going to, he would talk to them about marriage and what their marriage would look like. He'd talk to them about family, what family should look like. He'd talk about community and what community should look like. He would talk to them about, about uh, the neighboring countries and foreigners, and, and, and economy, and every aspect of their life. And he would talk to them about them, and he'd say, listen, I'm speaking a different kind of living into your life. So here's what happened. They went into the promised land, dividing line, conquered the south, conquered the north, divide the nation up into the 12 segments. Each tribe was supposed to expand their territory. And then, and then God distributed throughout the entirety of the land the Levites. They didn't get land. They were distributed throughout the land. They were to be experts in the word, and they were to communicate the word to the people so that a different lifestyle would be developed. So no matter where you came from in the world, if you came from Egypt and you came into the land of Israel and you went into the, to the, to the land that belonged to the tribe of Dan, you would say, these people think differently. They have a different value system. They have a different view of God. They have a different view of people. They have a different way of living life than we do in Egypt. And if you came from Babylon, it was the same thing. And if you came from India, it was the same thing. And if you came from across the Atlantic, it was the same thing. You saw an entire different way of living life because you were living life the way God intended. They took the kingdom of God with them. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to take the kingdom of God with us everywhere we go. You, go, you walk out these doors and you go back into your house and you're supposed to be living in a way that brings glory to God. And everybody in your home is influenced by it. I'm going to share one last story and then wrap this up. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. So I got saved when I was 18 years old, and just, or just about 18 years old. And uh, I had not heard, I knew nothing about Jesus. I, when I came into this outreach event, uh, it was in a massive stadium, and uh, I came in, I had never been in a Christian event. I didn't know what a Christian was. I didn't know a single Bible story. Uh, if you asked me, if there was a quiz, um, what happened to Jonah? I would have failed that one. Okay? I didn't know anything, nothing, completely foreign. I lived in this really crazy remote part of the world that the gospel didn't get to called Orange County, California. And uh, I had no understanding of the things of God. And I came in, I heard the gospel. I don't remember the details, but I remember this. You're a sinner, no argument. God's a savior, never heard that before. If I wanted my sins forgiven, I wanted to know God, I could invite him into my life. And I came forward and I prayed to receive Jesus and I met Jesus that night. And I went home and I immediately wanted my family to know Jesus. And so I, I came home and like right away, you know, that next day, shared what I understood about the gospel with my family. Nobody responded. And, uh, and so I, I realized I need to live differently so that my family can know that I've really met God. Now listen, I didn't read the Bible. I didn't go to church. It was two years later before I ever sat in a Bible study. But I knew God and I knew I was supposed to live differently. I have two brothers um, I am the most irresponsible of the three. 
And, uh, and as, a, as a child in the house, I was always irresponsible, never doing my, my chores. And so I decided I can show that I've really met Jesus by doing what I'm supposed to do. I remember one day walking by the dishwasher, and, it was, and I, I went to put dirty dishes in the dishwasher, and it was full of clean dishes. And normally, I would have just thrown the dishes in the sink and left, and I went, I can empty the dishwasher for Jesus. And I honestly, for the ent- I lived f- at my four and a half years after I got saved, before I moved out to get married, um, I lived in my parents' house, th- and for four and a half years, I would empty the dishwasher for Jesus. Now, why am I telling you that? Because we can bring the kingdom everywhere we go. Because we want to see God, we want to see the reality of the gospel spread everywhere we go. So Jesus is a king, and he's got a kingdom, and he wants the kingdom to spread. He's going to face opposition. So what do we do? We fight, but we fight different. We fight realizing it's a rescue mission and we've got the key. We fight different by letting Jesus have more of me. And we fight different by taking the gospel or the kingdom everywhere I go. Kingdom, living, everywhere I go.